So welcome to this afternoon's discussion on Stephen King's It. Uh, I know that we have multiple versions here, and I think um, people may have watched different versions, which is actually a little bit by design. Um, it's, it's perfectly fine to compare and contrast. Uh, certainly, there's a parallel in psychiatry. You might get a report from um, the patient themselves versus a collateral, and it's not going to always match. So um, as clinicians, you're going to have to decide what to do. And similarly, we'll talk about several characters here and maybe the different renditions and um, different behaviors observed, depending on one's perspective, made for TV, movie, novel, and of course, the most recent um, adaptation. So without further ado, is there a character, any place, anyone would prefer to start? No, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> you can start with Beverly if you wanted, because you had to start. Oh, yeah. Sure, I'll go, I'll go with Beverly, like gives here so Beverly in like the 2017 iteration is she is a victim of abuse but she seems to not have make she's maybe questionably some acute stress disorder or PTSD following that but doesn't really seem to have any of the lasting personality disorders that's just that sort of differentiated that differentiates her from like the book counterpart whereas she has like a lot of more promiscuous behavior, has sort of more uh, reactive interpersonal uh, conflicts and like far more emotional ability in either like part one of the TV version and maybe someone in part two as well as the books. Like that doesn't really show up in the movies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think across the different adaptations, certainly post-traumatic stress would, would be very high in our differential. And um, given her past history, and there's, I think, significant information pertaining to early childhood sexual abuse, yeah. uh, that would be consistent with the development of post-traumatic stress. Um, the difference between... Oh, sorry, sorry, just, you know, how the difference between how the book describes it versus like, the movie. I mean, I didn't read the book. I read it in some YouTube comments. But uh, the book mentioned that uh, the abuse wasn't necessarily sexual, that the father's abuse uh, increased or kind of changed in a way as she progressed through puberty, and he didn't really understand how to deal with her, you know, coming into womanliness. Also, interesting analogy is that her first manifestation of it is blood, you know, which could have been a trigger for her father, and you know, puberty and all that so blood in the bathroom specifically exactly yeah. Yeah. exactly yeah. so that it's very trippy yeah so that could you know all be i mean we all know that her father is like her biggest manifestation of fear but also this going into puberty also drives that sense of fear and just general fear of the unknown and what's coming next and like what that means for beverly as the only girl in that group specifically is very interesting right and yeah and she actually has a role in the um uh, the actual ritual which is pretty much the last part of their uh, their childhood experience with this inter interdimensional predator um and having sex with all those boys yeah, that only happened uh, not, in the books. Not yeah, not not oh, not oh, adapted. Yeah, she sleeps, <laughs> so in the books prior to the ritual, she sleeps with everyone in the group in order to like promote the unity and like yeah. sort of you know how like in the movies it's very much like hey guys we're together rousing speech. None of that in the move in the in the book. She just sleeps with everyone and that supposedly is what does it. It brings them all together. When they're in middle school. Yeah, they're yeah. twelve. It's really creepy. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. A but lot of in, in true Stephen King fashion too. It's all innocent. Like yeah. there's there's no there's no. Um, I mean, King, King makes every effort to make this a, manif a manif manifestation of uh, childhood uh, innocence. It is portrayed as like everyone is very naive about what's going on. And they just like, it seems like this is like something that they've heard that the older kids do. But it's like still very creepy mm -hmm. and feels like, mm -hmm. like to you and I, it feels very creepy. But there's like a weird sort of dissonance between like the innocence with which the characters seem to approach it and the actual nature of what's going on yeah. and because of that um it was uh, that was the clear motivating factor as to why it was not adapted oh yeah. Uh, so, yeah um so bringing it to 2022 um specifically next friday um the difference between acute stress disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder Time. more specific Time. 
right? Yeah. One month cut off. So everybody's cool with that. Everybody's all right with that. Yep. Um, for Beverly, um, uh, assuming she does meet signs and symptoms, assuming that she does meet the diagnostic criteria, is this ASD or post-traumatic stress disorder? PTSD yeah. has been going on long enough. Yes, yeah, it's been very long, right? Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about the signs and symptoms of PTSD, not necessarily focused on, on Beverly, um, but just in general so we can all make sure we're comfortable um, about next Friday. Uh, so, uh, post-traumatic stress along, oh, uh, and, and the DSM-5 has confounded this just a little bit, but it's probably best to learn along, along three symptom sets. So, uh, individuals will develop symptoms uh, largely due to an early tra traumatic event or a traumatic event. Um, so, the idea would be that prior to the trauma, the individual demonstrated no such signs or symptoms. Right? Those signs or symptoms fit into about three criteria, right? So you have the re-experiencing criteria, uh, the arousal criteria, and the um, what used to be the psychic numbing criteria, the avoidance criteria. Um, any any particular signs and symptoms you'd want to identify, and what particular symptom set they would belong to? No, no, no. Generally, let's keep it. Let's keep it shelf focused for for now. Then we'll go back and ask. The final question, and that is, does Beverly fit? Okay. Yeah. So for re-experiencing, it's like nightmares, flashbacks, um, like triggers. Intrusive thoughts. Uh, is intrusive thoughts re-experiencing or avoidance? I don't know. I feel like you're making a well, um, well let, let, let's actually finish the initial thoughts. So nightmares and flashbacks, right? I think everybody would have been very comfortable uh, identifying that. Now, on the shelf exam, you are very likely to see a nightmare and or a flashback present to you in the clinical context. Uh, that, is, that is likely. Unfortunately, that is not necessarily the case in real life, uh, meaning that other re-experiencing uh, re criteria, uh, as we are with nightmares and flashbacks, because in the absence, there's really no or there's, there, there is, I want to make sure I say this correctly, not necessarily any negative predictive value, mm. right? The absence of either of these does not necessarily mean your patient does not rule in because you do need to know the other signs and symptoms, which are what? Hypervigilance, mm. kind of like avoided behavior. Increased startling? Uh, oh. None of the above. You're actually in a different symptom set. And, I think, and that's the teaching point here. So just for this is the re-experiencing criteria. So I think somebody said it before. Always. Well, that's always. Intru intrusive thoughts, yeah. Okay. And, and I think one of the things we have to be very careful of is that when an individual presents with intrusive thoughts, how might they report their symptoms? They might keep thinking back to like the event or similar events, but not necessarily like a flashback. They might think like, oh, this thing well, is get, get, in, get into the role. Uh, what are you telling me? Okay, well, here's a good example. Um, you, let's say you like have a particularly, tra like you have a particularly traumatic case and you end up losing that patient and there's something about it that like, uh, brings you back to that case and you rec and you have these thoughts that are like feelings of like you think I'm worthless I should have done this or this should have happened or you like have these thoughts that you messed up in this way because you didn't do X it just keeps coming you can't stop it from happening again and again. Mm -hmm. and, and negative affirmations are part of this as well and very often and actually in the DSM-5 uh, are part of the criteria set, whereas in the DSM-4 prior to 2013, they were not. So that is exactly right. How might someone, what chief complaint might someone present indicative of all of this? Not nightmares, not, not flashbacks, but you're quick to remind yourself, oh, can't dismiss PTSD here. Feeling of worthlessness. Uh, well, along with intrusive thoughts. But, um, and people are not going to come in saying the words intrusive and thought in the same sentence. I can't stop thinking. Can't stop thinking? What else? Racing thoughts? Racing thoughts is very common. Okay. By the way, if somebody says racing thoughts, what might a clinician who is not part of this discussion automatically think and perhaps lend to misdiagnosis? Yeah, yeah you got to be careful here. Yeah. Right? 
The other one is uh, OCD, right? Uh, my OCD is worse than I have these obsessions. It's not necessarily wrong. I mean, the obsessions can be intrusive thoughts. And then would it present with just like the obsession without the compulsion that they usually do? Or likely. With compulsion? Like, no, it's, it's likely. So I, I, and remember, um, an individual is likely to present with only obsessions here. Okay. Uh, and that is still indicative of OCD. Right? You don't need compulsions. Now, the addition of compulsions to the HPI, to the past psychiatric history, uh, increase the specificity of your diagnosis or of your screen. But um, in the absence, it, will, it would rule in, especially, especially if you misinterpret one's intrusive thoughts as part of a PTSD, a PTSD spectrum as obsessions and obs- or obsessive thoughts. So be very careful. That's a teaching point. Intrusive thoughts may present as obsessions, uh, but are indicative and um, are defining of um, PTSD, uh, uh, specifically the reinforcing criteria. The other reinforcing criterion that I need you to know for clinical purposes as a, as a clinical pearl uh, are or is physiologic reactivity. Now, similar to intrusive thoughts, individuals are not going to choose the terms of physiologic reactivity. Okay? If they do, you probably have something else going on with your patient. Right? They're not going to say that. What will they say? My heart's racing, good. What else? <laughs> My heart's racing, right. Might have like symptoms similar to like a panic attack. Yeah, and that was my next question. Yeah. What might the uninformed clinician jump to and perhaps have them lend to? Um, arousal criteria. I heard a couple of comments before. Correct answer here. What were they? Vigilance. Good. Evil yeah. Irritability or aggression. Then right. behavior. Perfect. So, all right. However, negative predictive value, unfortunate. So you do need to know the other symptoms, which are what? In that same category? Or mm-hmm. Difficulty sleeping. sleeping. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Anhedonia? Uh, anhedonia is right, but it's a different symptom set. Okay. Right. Okay, concentrating, difficulty concentrating. That's exactly right. Okay. And if I were to tell you I have no exaggerated story, uh, I am not hypervigilant, uh, but I have severe insomnia and I have difficulty concentrating, the two things that an un, uh, uninformed clinician may jump to is thinking, well, this can't be PTSD then. Depression. Uh, and instead of depression. So, um, and be careful. I mean, might Beverly have been diagnosed with depression and panic. Because if so, that just actually supports our diagnosis, or at least our provisional diagnosis of PTSD. Mm-hmm. Okay. So anyway, um, that's the clinical pearl. You're, you are likely to see on a shelf exam a vignette that does include any combination of nightmares, flashbacks, exaggerated startle, and hypervigilance, um, but you don't have to. So please keep that in the back of your mind. Does any of this apply to Beverly? Yeah. How so? She gets a pe- like when her father reaches out to grab her hair. She like gets visibly tense, like looks really uncomfortable. Goes to the bathroom afterwards to uh, like chop, cut her hair. Uh, like proceeds to like cry in the bathroom. Anything else? So one part is a little bit of a cheat. Uh, because of the way the film is actually edited, uh, but there are flashbacks, mm-hmm. right? It's a little bit of a cheat because you know Stephen King is trying to inform us of her past history, um, her early developmental history, um, and how best. I mean, a lot of producers do it via the flashback. We don't know if they're true flashbacks or if this is just an editing tool, a production tool. Uh, but we can take advantage of that as psychiatrists, and we, we can we can actually look at this as flashbacks. All right, so it looks like there might be post-traumatic stress in Beverly. I, I think that's a fairly high yield working diagnosis for this particular character. Um, anything else going on with Beverly? If I recall correctly, and this is really more fleshed out in the in the novel, um, she marries someone who reminds her very she much does. of her father. He Right, so it's Beverly Rogan and um, Tom, Tom Rogan. Yeah, yeah, um, and that and that is sometimes referred to as traumatic reenactment. Right, 
Um, so uh, very consistent with post-traumatic stress. All right. Um, anything else for Beverly? All right, another character catch your eye? Oh, was Eddie's mom Munchausen by proxy lady? Yeah. So, yeah, it, it looks like um, Eddie's mother's afflicted with uh, factitious disorder. Um, the newest version um, has the medical terminology of imposed on or by another, um, which I think fits here. I have uh, a question. Yeah. Would it be factitious disorder? Because at least in the newer movie, she doesn't actually do anything to cause physical harm to Eddie and to like require him to see a physician. Like, I think she's just getting him placebo pills. But um, so in that case, is, is is it more like illness anxiety because he's not actually like needing to be hospitalized? Mm -hmm. Uh, not necessarily. I think from her perspective, it does look more factitious. Um, from his perspective, if we're going to focus on Eddie, the character, if he were to present to, uh, to clinical practice, um, there I think it's illness anxiety disorder. I think that's what he develops out of this experience. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there's two rather clear diagnoses here. Uh, one, though, is focused primarily on his mom. The other one on the character himself. Okay. Um, illness anxiety disorder, what is it? It's a preoccupation with either a specific or impending illness um, out of proportion to any real risk for it, uh, and it's not accompanied by any specific symptoms characterized by the illness or otherwise that differentiates it from somatic symptom disorder. Yep. So um, uh, illness anxiety, um, and you use the exact correct terminology, is a preoccupation syndrome. There are three times in the DSM where the word preoccupation is used to define an illness or syndrome, and illness anxiety disorder, the condition formerly known as hypochondriasis, is one of them. Okay. What are the other two? Uh, no, there the um, terminology is uh, fixed belief or delusion. Would panic disorder be one of them? Because you're preoccupied with like the thoughts of having a... Uh, like a panic attack outside of your brain. I think they use the word call? concern. Oh, okay. OCD? They use the word obsession. Mm -hmm. Pyromania, kleptomania? Oh. Um, uh, I don't think preoccupation is used for the impulse control disorder, so the, the disorders formerly known as the impulse yeah. control disorders. How about if I said instead of having a preoccupation with having or acquiring a serious illness, the individual is otherwise preoccupied with an imagined defect in oh. appearance. Oh, uh, <laughs> what about? Yeah. Is BIA, BIA, uh, is it? What's that? Body, integ body something integrity disorder. Never heard of it. Oh, it's like where you are convinced that like, you're, like let's say somebody's like, this leg is not my leg. Everything else about my body is fine. This leg is not mine. I don't like it. I want it gone. And like, it, Oddly enough, they're actually pretty happy and functional if you were to remove that, but nobody does that. Right. Might, that might be delusional disorder, somatic type. It's like alien syndrome is like connected to that in some level, but it's, it's more of a... No, it's, it's specifically body... In, it's like a weird... I don't think it's in the... In it's the like DSM-5, I think okay. it's in the ICD. Yeah, probably. Yeah, the DSM-5 captures that as a delusional disorder, specifically somatic type. Okay. Yeah. Um, don't they like it was show it related? Show it to them. In oh, hoarding disorder. Figure that's to reestablish. That's correct. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I command that preoccupation in the DSM five. Okay. Uh, I actually I didn't know that. The other one I was thinking of with eating disorders. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the other ones, but we'll have hoarding as a number four then. Thank you. Great. All right. So. Um, for factitious, and in the case of the, the character in the, in the film slash novel, uh, imposed on another, uh, differentiate for me between factitious and uh, malingering? Malingering is for personal gain or to, yeah, personal profit or gain. In factitious disorder, you don't get anything from it. You sincerely do believe that you have all of these issues. You're exa you're, you're, you're exactly you're exactly right up until the last comment. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's yeah. That. yeah. Girl. And then, therefore, what's what is the major similarity between these two conditions? You're consciously 
uh, like making something. Right, right. You're consciously deceiving, usually a healthcare practitioner, right? And the reason why differentiates. Uh, one is a conscious effort, the other one is subconsciously motivated. Right? And then how do both of those differ from um, the other disorders within that same chapter, which are the somatic symptom and related disorders? You're not consciously motivated. Yeah. Right. So individuals who present with conditions like somatic symptom disorder or conversion disorder truly believe uh, that um, they have uh, either um, a multi-system dysfunction and or uh, some kind of deficit in motor slash sensory function. Good. Uh, Anything else for Eddie? All right. Um, Any other characters? Mm-hmm. Stan's father's kind of a jerk, but um, really now there's anything to diagnose later. Diagnose jerk. <laughs> diagnose jerk. Access I mean, six. We could talk about the adults in town overall. They all seem to have this sort of like cognitive dissonance about what's going on. And I know that's oh. in, that's, there's a degree of intentionality about that. You know, I know they mentioned like, oh, yeah, like this disease that like all the adults have or, or something, but I think looking at psychologically you could say it's cognitive dissonance. They always tend to turn a blind eye to violence and they like, knowingly separate themselves from the reality of the children. Yeah. Which makes, you know, the children a lot easier to be preyed on. Mm-hmm. On the line of jerk, antisocial personality disorder in what's his name with the knife? Henry oh, yes. Henry, 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 Henry Bowers. Henry Bowers, yeah. 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 Uh he's He's a little psychopath. Yeah. yeah, so, um, you know, Stephen King is a good job here um, ensuring that the, the necessary part of the diagnosis of antisocial personality is actually maintained. And that is, num- not only do we see Henry Bowers as a child, but there's evidence of conduct prior to the age of 15, too, uh, which, is, which is very consistent <clears throat> with the American Psychiatric Association's definition. Yep. Yeah. It- Later on, the I don't remember if this happens in the old in the old TV special version, but in the books they have him like go, he's like essentially a puppet of it later on yeah. in life, that's and he's like one. oh that's the only one too, and he like is straight up just murdering people. So yeah. <clears throat> in real life, what's the best like management for antisocial personality disorder besides the penal? I mean, in addition to the penal system. Yeah, psychotherapy. <clears throat> the, the single best answer is psychotherapy for all the personality disorders with varying degrees of success. Um, empirical evidence, unfortunately, does not show um, uh, robust outcomes for antisocial personality with yeah. psychotherapy. But there are, no, there are no medications that are FDA approved for any of the above. Do you think as a society we are built to properly manage and rehabilitate antisocial personality disorder? I think some places do it better than others. In the 1990s version, Henry is really like visibly distressed when his friend, whose name I forget, gets sucked into the tube. Oh, to the first one. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Is that kind of incongruent with like lack of empathy, mm-hmm. compassion that we'd expect, or is it more like he's just worried for his own survival? Yeah, he might be worried for his own survival, but even if he's not. Um, that behavior in a vacuum wouldn't necessarily have us dismiss all of the other evidence that would support a working diagnosis of antisocial personality or even conduct. Uh, so again, there's no, there's, no, there's no black versus white here in terms of splitting. Uh, individuals have varying degrees of insight and empathy. Uh, so the idea of, by definition, no empathy in someone with this diagnosis doesn't really play out in real life. On the shelf exam, is a little different. Yeah. yeah. Was that... Was that um, um, is that Victor Chris? I'm not even sure who it was. What's it? The, what's the, what's it called? I'm forgetting. I forget, I'm conflating what they look like in the two yeah. movies. The other thing about the development of, of Henry is that he, he, Stephen King does provide some information about his developing schizophrenia. I mean, when he's um, in bed, um, I think he's incarcerated. I might be wrong. I might be in a hospital, actually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He he thinks he's getting messages from the moon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That that is not consistent with antisocial personality disorder, Mm -hmm. right? There's something going on there. Now, it might be an illusion, 
but he acts on his illusion or this illusion to the point where he's clinically um, um, an imminent danger to others. Right, right. Um, so it does look to be delusional. Um, and he does appear to be psychotic then, yeah. uh, which again, it's not necessarily consistent with antisocial personality disorder. Right. Now, um, nor, nor does it pose risk. That is, antisocial personality does not necessarily pose risk for future psychosis. Having said that, antisocial personality disorder is not protective of someone developing schizophrenia either. So we may actually have these two um, processes. Mm -hmm. He straight up murders his dad like very coldly mm -hmm. in the uh, new version, mm -hmm. like with it telling it like. It telling him to do it through the TV. Mm. Well, does it count if it was telling him to do it? <laughs> <laughs> does it count? Exactly. It depends that's on which perspective it. you're coming from. That's an excellent it's question. Right. Yeah. yeah, it could be a command hallucination. Yeah, uh, and, and that might suggest that he has um, evidence of psychosis even prior to his being hospitalized mm. at, at that young of, a, of an age if he's following the commands of a killer clown that's not there. Again, it's a single person's perspective, but it's certainly something to consider. And, and, and when in doubt, I will ask you to put yourself in a position where you are, during office hours, having someone visit you because of their being in distress, and they're telling you, HPI, that they are seeing or hearing the voice of Pennywise. Um, what would your reaction be? Because it probably shouldn't be that, oh, this is perfectly normal, because you're probably from Derry, right? I don't think anybody here, upon graduating from this medical school, would be doing that. Right? So when in doubt, put yourself in that real life situation, how would you react? What's up? I, I was just very upset with the ending because I watched the original and I said, "Excuse me, <laughs> I watched this whole thing for an alien spider." Okay, oh. so I like started thinking, and this theory might be very, very wrong, but in order to like really like figure out the psychiatric connection, I think that I I believe it could be very wrong that the writer uh, I I don't remember his name Stephen King. No, no, no. The, the, the book writer Bill. in the, yeah, in the film, Bill. Yeah. Bill. I think this is all like a big like delusion that he's built because of what happened to his brother first, which was the triggering event that then precipitated the delusion and the creation mm -hmm. of it. And then the problems in his marriage in the second half of the film, mm -hmm. where like he like goes into this delusion and all of his friends are like elements of his personality. Like, <laughs> Bev is like his sexual personality, and uh, ben. Ben, ben is his insecurities. His insecurities, and uh, who else? Who so else? There's like, like an DID? innocence one. Uh, oh, Stan, the innocent one who. I guess. Yeah, yeah based on like so what is the this? initial traumatic yeah. event of his brother being murdered, mm -hmm. and then he like goes into it whenever he has like a traumatic event in his life. And even like when they filmed the original, when I started paying attention, there are many like scenes where he is like the foremost person and everybody is behind him. I will say I like that theory, at least the Stan's innocent part, because Stan kills himself when there when it comes back. Well, because then I like that, that is the death of his innocence. I like because he is the innocent character. And I don't know. I also was like, everyone left the town before him, and like at the end, he like resolves and is okay with his wife. So based on the movie that I watched, that's what I came up with. Mm -hmm. So is Mike his grounds to reality? Uh, I, I don't really know. It, he could be. Mike is but like I don't. I thought like that. Boundary. Mike was like his more responsible personality, and yeah. the fact that he's like a librarian, he fits into the yeah. town. I also was trying to figure out if. He just like would bring people back and murder them at one point. <laughs> Mike himself, since he's the one that calls everybody. <laughs> Mike has gone from being the responsible, like good person to like the murder. It was another theory that I had, but it was quickly zilched when he got <laughs> when he got in trouble. <laughs> I like this theory. This is a good theory. So that was my my theory. Cause oh, and then he demonstrates like an an a little bit like of an arachnophobia because when he like is going to open the uh, fortune cookie, like you just see like a hairy leg slip out and like he like immediately like smashes like his napkin on top of it. And so I was like, maybe that could also be the like precipice behind the fact that it's a spider that is the villain in this movie. 
it's a spider with a baby's head in the book that comes out of the fortune cookie. Lovely. <laughs> yeah, a spider with the head of a baby. <laughs> Isn't that how it is in the sequel? Like, yeah. 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 But I just couldn't accept that the alien spider was really what was happening. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an alien spider, it's an extra dimensional demon spider being guided by whatever kind Satan. of spider is sending the spirits out <laughs> that are forming clouds. So you're, saying, <laughs> you're saying it's a spider because it's a direct manifestation of Bill's fear. Yeah. Bill is the main and potentially only character. And I mean like a clown could also be seen as like a form of innocence in and of itself that he then like twists into a bad character. Um, yeah. because, like, how he was cruel to his brother right before, like, he got murdered and everything like right. that, yeah. and how, like, he was, like, rejecting his love and rejecting, yeah. like, the affection that he saw from him, yeah. and, like, only came about, like, when he, like, gave him the boat, and it's because of the boat that his brother ended up going out in the rainstorm and being, uh, murdered, and he could blame himself for what happened to him, right. because he's the one who gave it to him. Right. Could you argue that the brother just got like horribly concussed and like died of head trauma when he like ate it right into the I mean, that, like, either, side? yeah, he either way, I think. Yeah, he got eaten by alligators. That was my conspiracy theory that this whole thing was a uh, delirium of, due to TBI. Yeah, due to traumatic brain injury. Uh, alligators better. But. I, yeah, but I thought that, that, like, that was the thing that could have precipitated it. And regardless of what happened to the brother, like, that he feels guilty about making that happen. So, just for, like, background, spiders specifically are a recurring motif in Stephen King's okay. stuff. Particularly, like, as a cosmic horror. Um, like, a lot of villains in the Dark Tower, which is, like, he is a minion of, like, it is a minion of the main antagonist from Dark Tower, mm -hmm. and also, like, related to other things in the mist, like, spiders are a recurring motif for them. I do really love it, because it validates the notion that on, even on a cosmic level, crown, clowns are disturbing and horrifying. <laughs> you could argue it's, like, a cultural thing. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, they, come, they come to the, like, Earth or whatever, they sure. see that this is a cultural thing. But it's funny, because, yeah. like, he's been around since the 1800s, so he decided that clown was scary back then. <laughs> His exact age in the novels is 12 billion, I think. It's, okay. like, he is a universal constant. Mm -hmm. Um, and the tur did they talk? Did they talk about the turtle in the old the, the turtle in the old version? Okay, that's some other weird cosmic. You would have hated that too, because that's some other weird. There's a cosmic turtle Bill does, that teaches them. Bill does step on a turtle. He does like step on a turtle. That's like a nod to it. But there's a cosmic turtle that teaches them the ritual. Like that's how they learn the ritual in the books. Is like they are they are guided by a like stoned cosmic turtle. One of the things, um, and I'm not sure if it's really captured in the film, but certainly it's discussed in the book that supports this working theory, is, is Ben's character. Uh, ben goes on to be a, a fairly successful architect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's got this moment when he returns to Derry where he realizes that some of the, the greater things he's created were actually motivated by his subconscious, uh, specifically how this library was a safe haven mm -hmm. and how this, and I, and I don't know, it's a cathedral, I'm not really sure, I forget what he built in Europe, was nothing more than a reproduction of this dairy library. Wow. So it's motivated from his subconscious. And boy, if, if that is the case, why wouldn't that be the case for this author um, who writes this novel, perhaps titled It, yeah. uh, who has undergone or has experienced a similar tra childhood trauma. Um, do, do you think... Um, Everyone but Bill dies in as a child. Oh, is he the lone survivor in, in, in how these different things become manifest as an adult? Perhaps I know that. Uh, I guess I sort of also like built from like supporting facts that like this is all centered around Bill because the only like specifically named people that are victims of it was his brother alone like he's the only one that had like a name and a title to him and everything else was like oh all these other children are killed they don't they're never like named by name or you don't like see uh any of the others yeah 
that whole in the in 2017 when I think they like they like need a bunch or something. Oh, really? um, yeah. they need people so in the books they go into it in the new version they go into it in the originals in the original TV specials they do not there's okay. one other victim that's named I think oh the little girl yeah. at the beginning of the second part she gets named oh okay. she gets named but only because her mother calls her in for it's been like 17 years for this <laughs> But oh her no, you're right. Her in you're very right. For like, Leanne? Yeah. Quite possibly. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's all the other members. The all the other members of the Losers Club do have significant interactions with it, and like you know, as far as we know, they they, they survive according to the movie. But you know, if everybody is a manifestation of Bill's illusion, then yes, they all could have died early on. Yeah, well, I wonder if Stan and. Bill, the only two survivors. Well, Stan, Stan is not a survivor. Uh, I mean, to adultity. Uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Because then he commits suicide. Yeah, yeah. When, when maybe it's Bill that calls him. Yeah. Uh, as uh, Mike. Oh, wow, that's yeah. so trippy. All right, uh, let's, let's actually piggy, uh, get this back to what you might see on a shelf exam and what we're all talking about here. Um, psych- psychology questions are fair game on your shelf? Mm-hmm. Um, and that includes Freudian psychology, right? So uh, if we're talking about concepts related to uh, this particular conspiracy theory, I think making it shelf relevant is just to quickly review uh, the id, the ego, and the superego, uh, and the role they may play in human behavior, mm-hmm. right? So again, the, uh, the id is that aspect of ourselves, our personality that houses uh, our impulses. These impulses are taboo. These impulses cannot come to conscious awareness. Uh, the way our, um, our, uh, our CNS prevents them from coming to conscious awareness, the cortical level, is through the superego, right, which prohibits. Uh, that is, it obeys the reality principle, prohibiting these taboo impulses to coming uh, to, uh, to conscious awareness. Uh, of course, all of this results in friction between what you want to do and what you are allowed to do, and that friction Freud termed anxiety, right? So uh, from here, I I would strongly encourage you to review the anxiety disorders because when your ego fails in its attempt to alleviate anxiety, an anxiety disorder certainly could be a potential consequence. And that could take one of many manifestations and therefore have one of many presentations on a shelf exam. Panic, nightmares and flashbacks, uh, obsessive thoughts, et cetera, okay? Um, When your ego uh, through its various defenses, it is able to keep that anxiety subclinical, the individual is asymptomatic. What defense mechanism does Bill then employ in this conspiracy theory by authoring the novel called It? Sublimation? Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, all of this might just lead to that conclusion that it is nothing more than the sublimation of one Bill Denbrough. If, if we're going along this line as well, do we? Is there like an element of like repression? Well, there's definitely a repression, at least in the books, and, and to an extent in the mo- in the '90s movies. I don't remember how much of everything they forget, but in the books, like none of them remember the events of like what happened in Derry when they were kids to any real extent until they come back and they have to go on like their own separate vision quests to like recall these memories and like so there's certainly like an element of repression there Mm -hmm. but in line with this totally awesome theory that you've got here which like should definitely go on like a creepypasta or something um uh Bill like I'm wondering if there's like an element of repression and is dissociation like considered like a traditional mechanism defense mechanism so then like an element of combining repression with dissociation here Hmm? yeah that's the other thing so if you were to look at this outside of this conspiracy theory and look at the individual characters the signs and symptoms they portray and therefore what mental disorder um, that they might actually be exhibiting so as to review a shelf exam. Um, defense mechanisms are going to be part of that conversation too, right? Um, on the other hand, might they just be representations of one character's defense? Um, uh, again, it's just two different perspectives of saying the same thing. 
and ultimately reviewing the same material. I do have another layer to this. As you were talking, kind of made me think about something. I'm not going to get into it right now. Um, but as soon as we log off, I'll share it with you. Uh, before we do, any final thoughts? Any last comments, thoughts, or otherwise about Stephen King's Ed? The one thing I will say, um, again, just as a parting thought in reviewing for next week's exam, if you look away from the individual characters and actually look at the quote-unquote losers club as a collective, uh, this is a case of dissociative amnesia. Right? They don't have any recollection of their childhood. They actually do have to go and visit literally their own haunts so as to rekindle those lost memories. Uh, so as a case, as a collective case, we're talking about dissociative amnesia. Along those lines, remember, uh, again, for shelf purposes, that this condition may include aspects of depersonalization and derealization to the point where you actually reach full criteria for depersonalization, derealization disorder. In such cases, you do not diagnose both. You diagnose dissociative amnesia. Right? You, you appreciate that this condition overrides the other diagnosis because aspects of depersonalization and or derealization can actually be seen in cases of dissociative amnesia. Dissociative amnesia can come in one and two variants. That is, there's a subtype, a qualifier, specifier of dissociative amnesia. What is the qualifier? Fugue. Yeah. All right, so you can have dissociative amnesia with or without fugue, some form of um, wandering away from one's home and usually assuming a new identity. I'm not sure that's not what's, uh, that, 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 well, I'm not going to lose just a double negative. That's another thing we may, we may, we may want to consider it's going on here. And then finally, there's the most severe condition published in the DSM within the dissociative disorders chapter that can also incorporate aspects of dissociative amnesia as well as depersonalization and derealization. However, if an individual has a distinct personality state that, that, that takes over the conscious awareness, that trumps all. That is the single best answer, and that condition is called what? DID. Yeah, DID. Uh, there's aspects of this that we could play around with here, especially through the conspiracy theory. Um, I kind of like the way you went with it um, on, on the, uh, you know, the other direction, however. Uh, but uh, DID would be the most severe form of dissociation in general, dissociative disorder uh, that's published in the DSM. All right, so we'll end it there. All right, we'll lock off here.